All right, what's up? What's up? Good to see you guys. Yeah, man, good to be here. Made it down from Fort Worth. Yep. Are we allowed to talk about that? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like like the first 20 seconds I got us in trouble. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'm just kidding. So introduce yourself. Uh, Chase Turner, CEO, SD Bullion. Sweet. I'm Cole Keller, uh, COO of SD Bullion, over trading. A trading machine that is. <laughs> yeah. He was he was down there trading stuff in the shop today. Dude, he was standing behind the counter and everything. <laughs> that I was just wanted to roll up the sleeves. You all been doing it for a while. Chase's background. I hadn't uh, had that outside of going to coin shows. I don't get that firsthand experience with yeah. customers. So what did you Jones think about of, the shop? Jones and Ford. The showroom. Chase and I were talking about it. Um, very impressive. It's a lot of square footage. More than yeah. kind of step back to the side. I mean, it's just a lot of ground to cover. Um, really well orchestrated, nice stuff on the walls, fun to look at. I mean, I'm not a museum guy per se. This is five times as cool as a museum to me. Yeah. 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 You don't get bored in there. Yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of cool things in a condensed area where, you know, and I think before we never really had prices on things and it was like, we had a retail shop, but you couldn't really buy stuff from us because we were so busy buying yeah. that there wasn't really anybody <laughs> to roam and actually... Please don't touch that. Yeah, yeah, right? So I was like, you know what? We need to sticker every single thing we have in there. It doesn't need to be out if we can't sticker it. Right? Yeah. If you can't put a sticker on it yeah. for what it's... For what it's Because, you know, guys these days, they're not going to... It's, it's like almost an ego thing. They don't want to look at something expensive and then ask you what it is and then be sticker shocked and look mm. embarrassed. yeah. yeah. So if you put the if you put the, the price on there, they can make their decision yeah, they without know right even away. yeah, and they don't have, even have to open their mouth, right? So they're battling with is this something that I want for a thousand bucks or yeah. well, the LJ Simpson helmet had a price <laughs> on it, and this dude was like, I know, I, I mean, I may that. walk, out, like, with I'm that walk thing. out with that. Walk out with it, yeah. <laughs> we almost yeah. got in a bidding war with him yeah. while, you, while you were over there serving the higher net worth customer. I'm fighting him for the two hundred and fifty dollars helmet. <laughs> yeah. What's crazy in that showroom is that you have like real pieces of history. Yeah, the Alamo letter. Um, I'm gonna misrepresent it, but like the, the letter, probably the commander. Yeah, the Travis letter. Yeah. Um, right next to the Texas you know, Constitution. Yeah, signed baseballs right next to signed helmet. Do you think that's the Constitution they're gonna use, like, to redraft the new one when it's time? <laughs> I mean, it should be the basis, right? Yeah. <laughs> just go in there, and start editing, and yeah. just back out the sentence. Yeah, we'll like, just use yeah. this. We're gonna use our doc. best OCR software. Yeah. We're gonna scan yeah. this, put yeah. it in a PDF. We're just let AI take that and just do a new version. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Yeah, everybody sign here. I think we're good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did anybody proof it? Nah, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, would, would you sign on behalf of Houston in that scenario? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. I don't want that to be tarnish my legacy there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, AI can't use let, spell letters or yet, so it's going to be a bunch of different, like, <laughs> backwards A's and E's and stuff. Yeah. So what is it, like, how is that different? So, like, energy-wise, like, so, I mean, you guys, obviously, you guys are one of the largest bullion dealers in the country. What... What differs from a coin shop, you know? Because I, I got to think that we're one of the biggest coin shops in the country, right? So, like, look, just looking at it as a work day, you, you can see how things are different, right? Tell me a little bit about how you... Uh, it's just amazing how much more hands-on it is. Yeah. The, you know, I think I used the word streamline, not not in a bad way, but, I mean... Yeah, I took offense sc- to that. Sc- <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. I, I heard him bristle at that. <laughs> he didn't like that. He's no. like, yeah, it's a lot more streamlined. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> you literally correct him. It's like you're pretty streamlined here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, hold on now. Yeah, yeah. Taking a shot at me now. No, I'm just kidding. Nah, but it was it was nice to see how consistently busy you guys were. I mean, there was there's people waiting. Yeah, uh, that's. I mean, you can only serve so many people. Yeah, right. And, and that's kind of the difference I think in a coin shop and what we do. Right. Our our job, like any time that we take on a project of any type, you know, it has to be how scalable is this? How many people can I serve? Right. Yeah. And you know, things like it's just a totally different, but. Man, it's it's such a nice refresher to come down to the streets, see the people. I was just dying to ask you if I could just go sit down in a chair and just like look at some you know old you know sterling silver jewelry stuff, just because yeah, like you said, like we don't get to do that. We don't get to face to face with customers, and it's yeah. just a much more total different different approach. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I could stay in there all day for sure. Yeah. yeah. So you've been CEO for how long? Uh, just over a year now. Okay. And how did you get in the business? Like, what was your, like, what, it's, it, we all have our own kind of, like, crash course on how we got into the yeah. business. And I want to hear both the y'alls, and maybe you can start. Yeah. Yeah, mine is a kind of a weird story. I was working for a guy that was buying and selling used cell phones. You remember the Cash for Gold days, like, when it first hit, and you had, like, MC Hammer. Yeah. Uh, you know, cashforgold.com. 
So in Oklahoma City, I was in, you know living in Oklahoma City. I'm from Oklahoma, and uh, those dudes that ran the Cash for Gold marketing called the CEO that, that I worked for. I was basically his assistant, and uh, said, "Hey, look, you know we do uh, we do Cash for Gold advertising. They spend about a million dollars a month with us, and uh, you guys have a similar business model. You know maybe we should talk." Hung up the phone like all this. All you know all we heard was like. They got enough money to spend a million dollars a month on advertising. Yeah. What's up with gold? <laughs> you know, <laughs> the timeout. Right? Yeah. Whoa. 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 What's up with these cell phones? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, long story short, at the time in Oklahoma, there was no cash for gold stores, and so uh, we had just that's how that's literally how we heard about it. We started researching like what is scrap metal. You know, gold was nine hundred dollars an ounce. We got yeah. the testers like that's seriously, and then uh, tester. <laughs> yeah, me and my best friend, we started a, a local shop just buying. Um, buying scrap and then eventually that led to um you know seeing coins you know i remember buying carson city gsa stuff back in the day we you know we just started yeah. you know moving some of that on our website and uh yeah it was, it was it was it was fun like like you know running a local shop there's a lot of potential issues and different things of course but, but we had fun we ran up uh we got three shops uh we ran gold from 900 up to 1900 you remember all that and then on the way back down, it wasn't near as fun. Yeah. <laughs> so we got out. And uh, I had a digital marketing background as well. I started, I've been doing digital marketing since 2005. And, uh, you know, after that, I was in Oklahoma City. just kind of made sense that I ended up at Amex. And, you know, been SD Boy. Nice. Here we are. Yeah, that's where we met. I'm, I'm originally from Kentucky. Went to undergrad. Finance, econ. <laughs> so in undergrad, naturally, if you're in finance, you're thinking, all right, investment banking, that's on wall street do whatever yeah and i went up there it was my junior year i think um and i kind of saw i walked down the goldman trading floor i was like okay this is not really because wolf of wall street wasn't out yet that could have yeah. saved me a lot of time <laughs> flight could save me all of it no um it's like two football fields worth of just stuff i don't, don't really want any part of we're getting like a snack at mcdonald's in new york in manhattan and it's like midnight and this dude's clearly just getting off work full suit and stuff i'm like that's I'd heard that's what it was, and I just knew that's, okay, that's probably not for me. Um, through a friend of a friend, knew a connection who was out in Oklahoma City uh, working uh, with a coin company, and so I just reached out thinking kind of long shot. I don't really want to know if I want to move from Kentucky to Oklahoma. Who knows? I would go out there for the interview. I'm thinking these guys are just selling gold chains, like flipping a sign on the street, like we buy, you know, what is this? Yeah. Pawn shop, right? And they told me how much money they're doing in business and how it's much different. Kind of blew my mind. They don't teach you about that in school. No one wants to talk about it. Literally, finance degree, econ degree, no one in curriculum wants to talk about gold or silver. Really? But if they do, they just blow right past it and kind of – Why do you think that is? Laugh at you. Well, from a banking perspective, if you kind of think curriculum is like anything else. It's – self arranged yeah and yeah. so w what's the purpose in talking about something that doesn't offer a yield doesn't offer a dividend like w there's a lot of different instruments and if you look at how finance has been run since 20 years ago basically with options derivatives and everything it's way more profitable so right. let's let's teach people how to sell this stuff effectively right. so no one wants to talk about metals because why would you it's, let's forget about that your grandfather's investment class so <laughs> i came in and they gave me they put me in the the smallest desk tucked away in the basement gave me the smallest little product line said you can manage stuff from um at the time he, it was you might tell him, he might not, he might not even know who they are new zealand mint is no not new zealand the holy land mint of of israel yeah um, and so I wasn't doing much. What, I don't know what you're just trying to pull out of me. Yeah. Uh, and so which wasn't doing hardly anything. But, really? you know, it's a good opportunity to come in and learn. So I spent a ton of time on the Internet. Um, he had joined the company a little bit after, so I picked his brain a little bit. And, you know, over time you learn, you take some chances. And so, yeah, completely different en entry point. Nice. Yeah. And, and now how much money are you managing? What, what are we doing on a trading basis? <laughs> yeah, I mean, annually, uh, I mean, on daily, Three, four, five million uh, annually. We're depends on how twenty twenty four goes, right? But we're probably hoping to s stay well above a billion. Um, yeah. But it's a unique opportunity. We don't have a ton of SKUs, so really, you guys are in a different segment of the business, doing the same thing that we're doing on the complete opposite side right. in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and there's some crossover, but in some ways, there's like zero crossover. Right. So it's always educational. Yeah, I feel like with the SKUs and in terms of managing SKUs and things, it's just you want to simplify it, but then yeah. also, too, you've got to have a broad range for your customer base, right? And it's just that 
it's always that give and take. Right? Yeah. You're like, you know, hey, I need to, you know, I'll come in sometimes and I'll ask them, run me skew of everything that's been dead for six months or for three months or 90 days, right? And just get an idea of things that are just not yeah. moving, right? Yeah. To get an idea. And you look at it and you're like, oh, well, I don't want to get rid of that. You know, yeah. as a collector or as yeah. a, you know, as a guy that's been in the business for a while, you see in the cycles, right? You've seen what gets hot and what, yeah. and how it, you know, kind of starts to dissipate and just overall action yeah. of the market starts to dissipate. And now you're in a premium, you know, rut like we're right now. And things are just not moving as well. Yeah. And you have, we have a lot of SKUs. I'll talk about us. We have a lot of SKUs that just don't sell as much. And you, you scratch your head. You wonder why. Yeah. What do you guys do when you see stuff like that on your side? Yeah, there's there's a bunch of different ways, different levers, if you're building an effective business to be able to pull off from on deals, hit yeah. customers, be able to talk to them on the phone, which is a huge opportunity for you guys to add value people to walk in the door, which is very different than us since we don't have a brick and mortar storefront. Sure. So you're always having to either on the phone or most of the time via website, you don't ever have the chance to directly interface with people. Right. To add value, educate them, get them to trust you. Um, that's a challenge. Whereas in person is amazing. That's why I wanted to do it so badly. I was like, it's, I'm just going to be able to talk to you and you're going to know pretty quickly that I, I might know, you know a little bit enough about. to help you or to at least answer some questions. So um, to with dead inventory, um, a lot of times it's buying it right, but you got to take some chances. Sometimes you got to just go for it, right? You guys do that actually more than us on a on a premium basis. Uh, we'll cycle things out. We don't. We keep things pretty limited so that we don't have that many of those uh, you know problems on our hands. Other coin companies have a lot more of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the differences I would say, maybe not so different, but I, I think somewhat different in being you know, like, like like a bullion house is people are have saving plans in bullion. Right, right, just like they do for an IRA. Right. And so every month, you, you definitely have those buyers that are just cost dollar averaging. They're going to buy. Yeah. So you're always going to have some basis of business, I think, I think to go off of. And um, because the relationships that we have now uh, in the industry, we're able to just provide great value to those people on our deals page every week. Right. And so, you know, just, it's, yeah. So you definitely have that consistent flow of buyers. Uh, we, we don't get really too stagnant. I think because we run so lean, as far as the SKUs that we house, like, you know, some competitors have 40,000 SKUs. Right. Okay. We don't have that. So I don't think we have really too many burdens ever no, at any given time. It definitely happens. but And you see yeah. this happen a lot of times with, I'd say, like 25% or maybe more of the bullion programs that are brought to market by anybody. They're just poorly conceived. Yeah. Someone's making the call on it that maybe isn't in the <laughs> business, working on the business, running it, knowing what's working, what's not working. We're pretty sl- – slim lean overhead so we know what's working just constantly because we're working on it and in it and so we just don't make as many bad decisions to a massive scale because on bullion you're committing to fine i'm gonna take two hundred thousand ounces of this silver yeah. product or twenty thousand of this gold well that would have really really hurt us yeah. we just haven't made those mistakes right yeah. so okay in that same breath so what if and i don't want you to give a not a roadmap but maybe what are what are some of the what are some of the what are some of the keys that you guys stay close to when you're making these products or developing these products or bringing these products to market? Is it, okay, first things first, we have to stay within a certain relation over spot in terms of a premium over spot. Is that, is it premium first or is it design first? What, tell me a little bit about the formula. I think, I think it's design and story. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's like we talked about, well, I mean, like, let's just give a little bit of origin story here, right? We, we met in Berlin a month ago. Right. Thanks to Hayden Tubbs, a little shout out. Uh, Hayden Tubbs, uh, you know, set us up. And I think the synergy there was, uh, hey, look, this is uh, the old guard. Things are done the same way all the time. And the creativity, right, of, of making some changes. And so normally when somebody puts out a bad bullying program like he's talking about, it's normally because like that's just how it's always been done, right? Like, yeah. and so if you're if you're at SD Boyan and like and you're in one of our brainstorm meetings, like this is going to be the same as at US Coins. I mean, you guys are going to be thinking very cre- creatively, right? right. And, and and really at the end of the day, like who is our audience and what are they like? What do they want? Like what really appeals to them? Sure. Like that's where the conversations always starts. Yeah. Yeah, and usually what we're trying to accomplish, if you're offering a product but you're charging them more for it, then what's in it for them? If you can't answer that with a straight face out, yeah. and be and stand behind it on the buy side whenever, then it's it's just really tough to do that year over year, program over program, 
whenever we launch something, we want to be able to do it again next year with the sure. same type of thing. Of Otherwise, it's just a lot of time spent. And so you do that by creating and adding value in the way that a collector market would actually recognize and appreciate. And it's not just one market participant or market maker saying, you know, this is just what the market is. Yeah. It says who? It says you. But are you going to sit there and fully back your own market? And most of the time the answer is no for a lot of bullion participants. So the customer is the one that gets holding, help, left holding the bag at the end. Right. Uh, so don't try to be greedy up front. Set parameters that actually allow the guy to win. Right. Uh, if he is a collector and wants to eventually sell it back naturally, I hope they do. Um, it's the same program you guys have, right? Like uh, somebody buys from you. If somebody buys some of our exclusive stuff – and you come to sell back to us, like you gotta buy it. We're not gonna hide the bid or whatever. Yeah, you're saying last night, like yeah. we're gonna honor it. You yeah. know, like, you gotta honor that bid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To all and, you, all uh, you uh, bid hiders out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's lots of you. Yeah, you put a bid out there, you better buy it back. Yeah, right. yeah. So you know, sometimes you just gotta. Sometimes you just gotta eat that bad, you know, medicine. And, well, I mean, but it's good for the program. It's it's good for everybody. But it, you know, it, it is kind of like it's good medicine. I mean, it, they bought it, right? I mean, yeah. that's that's the hardest thing in the world just to do, get somebody to trust you to buy something. Right, and then it's hard to do it twice. But once you do it twice, then you can do it three or four times, right, yeah. and even more, right. Yeah. And like you said, to your point, you're making something in mind to do in 2025, 2026, a yeah. different iteration, right? Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, two hundred thousand ounces. It can be something smaller, a little bit yeah. more boutique, because I feel like that's really what people are looking for more now is ex- ex- exclusive exclusivity. Yeah. They want something that you know, Joe Blow doesn't have or what didn't have access to. And hopefully yeah. they just paid a, just a small premium over what they would have paid for a normal, let's just say a Buffalo round or something. Yeah. And I, I think that's kind of what, you know, we, we talked at length in Berlin about this, both of us, um, or all three of us. And I just feel like, I feel like you guys have such a great market for that because you've already got such a great, you're insulated with a lot of good customers that you guys have been able to create. Yeah. And now it's just like you can feed them things at a fair price that has a great story, like you said, and that's a little bit some somewhat exclusive, right? And that's what people want. But but like something you said that really resonated, trust. But if you if you get them once, you get them twice. And if you, if you go back to like any program that we bring on SD Boy in, I think we've built that that trust over ten years. People like our customer base knows we're not going to come out with something that, that's bad for them. Of course not, right? And we're not coming out with something <coughs> new every every week like some other people do. Right, and so anything that we bring to them, I think that trust is there. Like, oh, this series must be, you know, worth looking into, or SD Boy wouldn't wouldn't even taking it on. I agree. Right now, as we get bigger, it gets you know, there's a lot of series coming at us, and it's it's gotten harder to I think pick and choose. Yeah. What we want to do and how we want to do it, but at the end of the day, our customers trust us. Just like you know, you got you you handle that a lot, and man, one of the ma- most amazing things I saw today was, uh, you know, we got Yankee in town. He's doing videos with Matt. And they were doing a lot of video. There was a guy that came in. Um, I, I, you know, he left. Okay. And Matt, dude, Matt was like, just like, he, he picked up on it instantly. He's like, did, he, did anybody say anything? He tried to, like, chase him out into the parking lot. Like, the level to which you guys treat people is insane. Like, you guys clearly put that first and the business second. Oh, of course. Right? Yeah. And that's what makes you guys unique. That's what makes you you. Well, that was, and that's dad, right? That's, that's, um, that's just getting beat into your head over and over again. Like without the customer, you got nothing, right? And without trust, you've got nothing. Without good relationships, you got nothing. And we talked about this last night. For me, it's relationships first and then business second. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like with relationships, you can make them strong. And, and once those are strong and you're unified in what you're doing, man, there's just no, there's no limit to what you can do. Yeah, I saw the commonality, all the people coming through. First question when your guy's going to ask him a buyer, he's going to ask him, like, hey, or if they're you know, buying from you, have you done business with us before? And everyone was yes. Not anyone was no. That stood out to me. Another one was a guy sitting down selling a handful of gold bars, and uh, your buyer's like, what? Well, making small talk while he's getting it queued up in the system. He's like, well, how'd you hear of us? He's like, well, I mean, I, technically the radio, you guys do some radio stuff locally, but I've been in Houston for a while, and I know you guys have a really good reputation. You know, he just offered that up. That's word of mouth, right? It's, you can't you can't pay for that. Yeah, which is it takes time. Yeah, out of that number of customers that I tell you that we do a day, it's about between it's between seventy five and eighty percent returning. Wow! So our our, re- our returning rate is the highest I've in any business I've ever been in. Yeah, and 
And that's just, again, it's just really trying to put ourselves in the shoes of that customer in every instance and make sure that we offer them. Because it is, you never know what someone's going through. And even your great customers, they, they fall on hard times, right? If you're, if you're a man that invests money in things, it's not always going to be roses, mm-hmm. right? And we want to make sure that just because this guy has, you know, been a high net worth customer over some period of time, there's going to be a time where this guy might come back and need to sell it. And we want to make sure that we're, we're putting ourselves in his shoes. You know, he's going to have an ego about it. He's not going to be happy about selling it. You know, there, what guy have you ever seen that's happy? That's a stacker. Or that's a builder of metals and wealth that has to sell it for yeah, property yeah. tax or because, you know, his daughter's getting married. They want to buy him a, you know, $400,000 house in Kentucky or whatever, wherever. Yeah. Right. And it's, I'll get you a long way in Kentucky, by the way. Get you a long <laughs> way. Well, I just see it a lot, you know. And these yeah. guys are like they bring their coin collections in, and they're you know they're yeah. a doctor or they're you know accountant for X amount of years, and like, well, listen, I've got, you know, I've got you know X amount of taxes that I have to pay this year, and something happened, and it's yeah. like I don't want to sell my coin collection, but I kind of have to, yeah. maybe. And it's like, okay, so what am I going to do? Am I going to sit there and, and browbeat the guy? Yeah, right? Lick your chops. Heck yeah. no, no. I'm going to sit there and I'm going to try to make. If I want to make ten percent, I'm going to try to figure out a way to make seven. And I'm going to do that because that guy, if that guy got, if he bought them from us, then I'm going to work even harder. Yeah. And if he unfortunately didn't buy from us, we're still going to take care of him. And do we have to? Yeah, we do have to because yeah. that's what we say we're going to do. Do you see a lot of stuff come back o- over the counter from like people that have bought this IRA, super high premium stuff? They don't really know what they're buying. They get caught up. So we don't, so we get a lot of emails and we get a lot of, uh, yeah. we get a lot of referrals. So it, because obviously the IRA business is nationwide, we get a lot of outside business callings and, hey, can you guys help facilitate this deal? You came highly recommended from so-and-so or so-and-so. And, yeah, you know, unfortunately that happens. And it's and that's – we talked a little bit about it again last night, and I just – I'm not a big fan of that. I don't think that that's good for anybody except the person – the salesperson that sells it. And if that's the case, then I'm in the wrong business. You just – that's what – that's what kills good business runs, right, is things like that. Yeah. And – Again, back on the fair bullion side, you want to be able just to sell it at a fair price. It yeah. doesn't have to be the best price. It doesn't have to be the worst price. It has to be fair, yeah. right? And if you're going to buy it back, then you get to set that price. If you're going to step out and say, I'm going to buy this back, well, then I think you're being as fair as possible. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really like appreciate that approach. Like, So coming from the bullion side and kind of always being in bullion, I always saw like the collectible side is just like price gouging, you know, margin, you know, these guys don't care, but you know, they're just making money or whatever. It is, it's been so nice to meet you guys and kind of see the other side of like, Oh, like there's actually a side of collectibles that is fair value. That right. is like you can make money on. And there's a lot of argument Transparent for too. why you could be in that versus bullion. Yeah. Like it makes sense. So uh, it's, it's been a nice learning <clears throat> experience. Uh, you know, I get to see what you guys do, how you handle your business. I'll say, man, what we've been dealing, I've been dealing in, in rare coin collectibles for a long time. And I, I, I've, there's a lot of good businesses out there that, that, that'll do that. And and there's obviously a lot that aren't. Yeah. But I do believe that the longevity of this business relies on more people doing it the right way than the wrong way. Yeah. And that's, I'm not a Harvard scholar. I, that's just common sense to sure. me, right? You just got to take call care of people. Call me crazy. Of, yeah, call me crazy. Yeah. But I think if you take care of people, they'll come back, right? And so that's been the crux of what we've done for a long time. And I love coins. So yeah. if I sold you something, there's a nine, t- nine times out of 10, I bought it to because I want to see it again. Yeah. So if you want to trade it in, trade up, trade out, get into another series, then we welcome that. We're okay with that. Mm-hmm. We don't look at a buyback look, oh, great, we got to buy this back. It's like, oh, cool, we get to buy this coin back. Yeah. Because a lot of times if it's a nice coin that was, if it's a sub-$1,000 collector coin, the customer probably did okay you know, over a period of time. Mm-hmm. Right. If it's a nice looking coin, something that's CAC worthy or something that's a nice, you know, P or PRN coin that just looks nice in a holder that rare coins don't have crazy runs, right? The, the rare, rare stuff always does. And the rare, rare stuff is always harder to get and it always sells in these markets. But your, you know, your own INS VDBs and your 93 S dollars and your, you know, 32 quarters and 32 D quarters and stuff, the stuff that people saw as a kid as they were collecting and they always wanted to buy it no different than like as we grow up it's like i remember this baseball card that i always yeah. wanted and it, it was 100 bucks and i only had 50 and i wasn't gonna spend it all on a king griffey junior rookie and it's now i've got eight of them right yeah. it's like <laughs> going back to buy that card right going back to find that one collectible that you always saw your buddy had or you know when you know 
that's where the older guys come in. They're like, hey, I want to find an 09 SVDB because <laughs> they were $22 when I was Gotta working. And I was working for a pharmacist, and I was rolling up his pennies. And, you know, he had, you know, two of them, and I always wanted one as a yeah. kid. So they'll just drive in and they'll say, I want to buy an 09 SVDB. Show me one. And they'll show them three or four of them. They'll just pick one out and walk out the they door. Go. And you're just like, wow. Wow. <laughs> All right. How cool is that? There are people yeah. like me, yeah. right? Yeah. There, are, there are guys. I'm not alone. the only one. I'm not alone, right? Yeah. yeah, because I'll walk into a card shop and I'm gonna say, "Okay, I want to find." I was on the hunt for a um, uh, John Olerud. Uh He was a first baseman for the Blue Jays, and I, I always thought he was awesome. <laughs> and then Wally Joyner, you know, another one of those guys where I just always wanted a Wally Joyner card and never found one back in the day. I think he was an '86 Fleer was his rookie year, and I bought one on eBay the other night. For the hell of it, and it just again, it's just like you know what I, I saw him in a movie. What was that? Um, you guys, you guys watching any like old school baseball movies? Yeah, sure. What was the one where not the kid with the arm? Where, um, oh yeah, yeah. Major was that not Major League? Um, um, kid with the arm. Um, yeah. The Chicago Cubs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Falls falls down. Breaks falls his down. arm. Yeah. Uh, he ended up in American Pie. Right. The movie. Oh, did he? Yeah. Oh wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> Yeah. Did he really? Yeah. Dirty little dog. I didn't know that. <laughs> and then there's another one where the kid was, a, uh, uh, the, the, his grandfather owned the Twins. Uh, okay. The, or, yeah, I think it was the Twins, Minnesota yeah. Twins. Yeah. And then he ended up becoming the manager. Yeah. In that movie, there's a lot of cameos of, of baseball players. And okay. Wally Joyner was a, was a hot first baseman there. You know, and I was like, dude, I forgot about that Wally Joyner card. I'm going to get on eBay right now. I'm going to buy it. Shout out to eBay. Yeah. And, um, man, I just jumped on there and bought it within you know, 30 seconds. I had it in it. You know, on its way to not say not on its way to get authenticated, but the process had started, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I love about collectibles because I just don't think that, that passion's ever going to die. People want to collect things. Yeah, they want to collect things. It's just it's natural. Like I mean, we're, we're hunters and gatherers, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like you are going to collect things. You see value. Yeah, it's just you know, some people are like real estate. Some people like yeah. financial markets, overseas markets. I mean, it's all some form of collecting, right? Whether you're you know, stashing cash or Bitcoin or whatever it is, or stacking metals. Speaking of stacking metals, you guys have a crazy stacking follow up. Tell me a little bit about that and how you guys kind of came in to be like the stacker's choice. Man, it all started in 2011, a website called silverdoctors.com. Okay. So uh, SC Boyan was originally founded by uh, two doctors, met in pharmacy school at the oh, University wow. of Toledo. And uh, they started blogsilverdoctors.com, uh, took off. I mean, it was at, you know, probably within just a handful of years, it was the largest gold and silver news website in the U.S. Uh, I think, he, I mean, you know, Eric Sprott, mm -hmm. he uh, was a regular reader of the website and called it out on a few interviews that he was doing back in the day. Hey, I, I go to silverdoctors.com every day. And then uh, from there, that's how SD Boyan got birth. I mean, this, you know, you got to think like 2011, there wasn't really many places to buy online. Right, yeah. hardly at all. Yeah, and like today now, like you know, one of the hardest things that's that's very difficult to enter our side of the business is like, okay, you you want to you want to start a bullion website? Great, mm -hmm. you got to like make no margin. You got to ship orders for and enter them for free, right? All all these things. So when, you know, like when you think back to two thousand eleven, you you place an order for like a gold eagle online, you had to pay at a minimum thirty five dollars for shipping. Sure. Plus you had to pay insurance, all this stuff, and there was only kind of one name that was there. Right, so they kind of got to call their premium as well, and so basically what they did on Silver Doctors is they went out to the, they, they just sent out a blog post that was like, hey, I know we got a bunch of people on here that buy bullion, you know, that stack, but they, they were stackers themselves. I, you know, I shouldn't leave that out. Like, you know, the two thousand eight crash when silver was down like eight dollars or whatever. Oh my gosh! You know, both these guys were maxing out their credit cards buying. So I mean, these these dudes are the, some of the largest gold and silver <laughs> bugs on the planet. Really? And so you know, they said, hey, uh, sent out a, a blog post. Hey, you guys want to get together and do a group buy? Well, dude, they have, and that's 2011, they had $300,000 of interest. Oh, my gosh, really? Yeah, for just, just send a post out. Oh, shit. Yeah, and so they said, huh, maybe, maybe we should It's a lot just, of money back then. It's like, a lot of money right back out of then. A, yeah. the, out of the yeah. crash, I mean, that's... Out of a blog post. 300 grand, man. I yeah. Mean, that was, that was yeah. a lot of money, man. I, I mean, I knew people that were losing two or three to one on housing here in Houston, which is, Houston real estate's normally pretty stable, but yeah. nobody was safe, right? Huh. <laughs> I mean, nobody was safe. No, uh, man, speaking of that, dude, you got to meet our guy, Jeremiah Babe. He's got crazy stories out in California. Really? Just, just uh, yeah, he's going to be on our podcast this summer. Oh, and, I want to stop you real quick, and I want to ask you, you said the guys were 
Vegas Gold Bugs. What do they think about this economy in this in this market as it relates to gold and silver? Or have you? Are you? I mean, you're in constant. Well, it's look. It, it's it's no secret. Like SD Boy has a significant amount of inventory, and it's completely unhedged, right? So the and it's a single owner now, right? Yeah. Uh, it's one of the first owners, right? But sure. it's a single owner. Uh, so. What does he think about like gold and silver? He's all in. That, <laughs> you know, he's he's unhedged. In. What does that mean? He's, yeah. Yeah. he's, he's unhedged. It, I, like, don't, I don't know. If there's anything you can do yeah. to to be more in. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, so you know, you know our positions. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. We're you know another thing that we're very aligned on. Right. Our our beliefs and and unfortunately, like there's just not a lot of people. Your your side of the business is so different because most of the people that are in your side of the business probably came up, like or they got they got turned on to coin collecting for some reason. Our side of the business is, is a very high volume. You know, it can be a little bit more competitive in different ways, and you have a lot of, like, business people over sure. there, right, that have no background in gold, silver whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And so back to kind of the, the original question of how did we get the following? Well, after Silver Doctors, they said, okay, obviously there's people that that want to buy gold and silver with us. Let's just let's just start a website. They started sdboying.com. And Silver Doctors kept growing, and, and so we came from the community, like, you know, if you go back all the way, like, we were doing interviews of everybody, like, way back in the day, our, our YouTube channel before, you know, one day we woke up and silverdoctors.com was on a list of 200 fake news websites. I believe that was 2016 during the election. Wow. Like, Zero Hedge was on there. Like, wow. and then uh, since that time, like, Google shadow, shadow banned us. And, you know, unfortunately, like, that was kind of the end of Silver Doctors because of that one article. Wow. Yeah. But we've always been uh, with the community. Coin. You know, we've always been, huh? You need to do a coin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't do a big one, but it'd be, yeah. it'd be cool just for the die. I mean, look, yeah. you got diehards, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, dude, I mean, y'all have. There's guys that, you know, have been with you since 2012. Yeah. 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 Diehards. Yeah. Yeah. But it goes back to that, like, you know, if you if you look at the competitive landscape of uh, of the boy in space, um, you know, we're out there telling everybody, like, yeah, we're, we're gold, silver bugs. We believe in it. You know, we put our money where our mouth is. Like, we support the community. We're with you. We're on your side. You know, that resonates pretty well with sure. I mean, people that buy gold and silver don't trust the government, right? They don't trust fiat. No. They don't really trust anything. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and so if you're not with them, you're kind of against them. Sure. You know? And anyone that's buying from us, we're already the biggest buyers in anything we sell. We have to be because we own it yeah. as a company. So it's not us selling. It's you're effectively coming in on something we've already been a major buyer of ourselves it's right just is what it is it's a good point i mean are you able to explain that and get that point across on the website it's now that i think of it no um it's probably not been uh, something that we've been attempting to, to get you, that point across but would it resonate with people now that i articulate it i'm sure yeah because i think that's you know it's i think I'll just translate a phone call or two that we get, and this is just like a common phone yeah. call, but it's like, how do we know it's real? Mm-hmm. How do we know you're you're sourcing it the right way? And it's like, we own a bunch of this. And I told you, like, every year I make a pretty large commitment into yeah. of, of gold and silver, right? And it's just because, why not? I've been in the business and around it for, you know, around, around 20 years now, mm-hmm. and it it has done nothing but go up, right? It doesn't go up every day, obviously, right? right. But over yeah. a, over a period of time, when I got into it, I bought with my first paycheck. I remember it was like twenty one hundred bucks, and I bought an Inglehart hundred ounce bar for six hundred bucks, wow. and I stacked it right next to my desk. Wow. And I, I won't say I did it every, you know, every you know monthly paycheck, paycheck yeah, or yeah. whatever it was, because I, mean, I wasn't making anything. Yeah. I was making <laughs> jack, right? Yeah. But I had 600 bucks to buy silver, right? Because I just figured, man, this has got to be cheap, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, this wow. sounds so cheap. And there were times I think it was 580 yeah. you know? And I, I just remember stacking one on top of each other. And I bought my first home, and they can I can't, you know, I sold them. And yeah. I think they were 9 bucks or something. And it was, it, 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 it was exactly, and to me, that was the start of me stacking metals, right? I didn't, I didn't ever want to sell it. And the plan was to never sell it, but man, it's nice to know that it's there and it gained 15 or 20%. And even if I, even if I lost 10%, it would have been evaporated in my checking account because I would have bought a hat, a shirt, fishing, uh, surfboard, skateboard. I I would have bought something. It would have been replaced with something. And that's where I always feel like 
I love that stacking community. And really, I tell you who introduced me to the stacking community was, was Miles. Okay. And obviously I knew about it. I'm not, you know, I'm all, I'm on the internet. I mean, I'm on the internet and stuff. I mean, I see it, but I'd never really talked to anybody in the mentality of behind stacking. Right, because it's like okay, you're a stacker, so you just buy metals and put them in the safe, and it's like eh, it's a little different than that. Like I mean, you know, it's like you you show it off, and you, it, and there's different ways to kind of go about it. And I really love the social media aspect behind it because it's great and it's great for the hobby. And you know, Miles introduced me to a few guys that I that were you know premium stackers or. Yeah. What do you call like the the grand poopas of the uh, stacks community? Like you know, daddy fat stacks over yeah. here. They, like, they don't let me in the room with them, so I wouldn't know. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, so it, and I just talked to a few of those guys, and, and and it really like you start hearing the passion behind it, and then yeah. and when I hear a passion behind something, yeah. and that's when people get my attention. Right? I don't want to listen to a long, you know, uh, a winded conversation about something that you're reading from a script or something mm-hmm. that you memorize, right? It's that when you get that really invigorated and you get the passion, it's like, okay, I'm, okay, I'm listening, I'm listening. Like, yeah. I want to hear about it. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of guys out there on Instagram I follow now, and if they go live, I'll watch them. It just, yeah, yeah I yeah. think it's cool, man. Yeah. I think it's cool that people found another way to market the hobby yes. that's more lower premium and it's educational, Right, because the stacking guys, if anything, they're very educational. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, and they they do their homework. Yeah. They're not on there just talking out the side of their mouth. They've got normally. It's organic, man. It's, yeah, it's all organic. So it's, you guys, you guys have done well with them, right? Yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, you think that's just lightness of mind overall? At the end of the day, I mean, you said it basically, right? I mean, our value proposition is is pretty consistent in terms of what we take on, what we offer them. We don't develop stuff that doesn't really actually serve what we believe their, their, their biggest need is. Um, so, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's always nice because I feel like, you know, in a lot of ways, like I, I am the customer, right? Because I am. Yeah. Like I, I have the same mindset, right? I, I stack, I prep, I, I own guns. Like, I, I'm, yeah. you know, and so. Um, MREs. Huh? You got MREs? <laughs> no, 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 no. I actually do have some. <laughs> you do? Yeah. You yeah. Do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, nah, man, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> you said you no, were a customer. Yeah, no, no, but yeah, like so. I, I write, I write the emails and stuff. I, or at this point, I, I usually like I'll go over them before they go out because yeah. they're all, they're all written. Like I feel like I'm writing to myself all sure. the time, and that connection. It's a journal think, entry. Yeah, it's a journal <laughs> entry. Yeah, yeah, but I think that's that connection that we have um, with them is just different than what they get other places, right? Because we're so vulnerable about who we are. We're we're out there. We're on these things. We're Again, we're just we're just sitting on the same same side as them. Uh, I, we're not going to get everything right, but we are authentic. Yeah, we we certainly try our best to be. Look, when I met you guys, I I was uh, I was I was impressed. You know, I I you know I was impressed. I I thought you guys spoke from a place that was honest and that you know we've always we've done business and it was it was very easy to do. So looking at making a recommendation on something or you know, someone's asking your opinion, it's always good to be able to know <laughs> right, what you're oh, talking yeah. about. And I think that's important, right? And that's why I like the, the whole networking aspect of it where it's like we do the same thing. We, we're in the same business, but we don't do the same thing, right? Yeah. And there's ways to find synergies around yeah. maybe not our main product lines, but there's always ways to try to find other things. And I think, man, that's just the, that's the budding of this industry, and that's what's going to keep it going, that mindset. Well, especially with all the consolidation, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've talked about that. So, yeah. It's so, because of people, some people didn't think it was coming. And I yeah. Tell them this consolidation's coming. Like, oh, the market's already consolidated. I'm like, oh, yeah. you don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's more every day and it's not going to yeah. go away. I mean, it happens in every industry, right? But I don't know. I think our industry is unique, man. We have a unique product, we got a unique clientele. And, uh, you know, that's why we're here. There's so many things. That I think the new guard, I like to think that we're kind of the newer guard in, a, in an older industry. Uh, there's just so many things that I think that we can do together uh, to to serve the community, right? To add value out there where, where value is not given. Sure. And uh, I think that's what's most exciting. Yeah. Uh, to me, at this point in my career, if you will, I mean, I, you know, we got a long ways to go, but I think just just changing things, man, like trying to make it closer to what other industries are are, are like. Right? Yeah. I just feel like our our industry is so starved for that, man. It's ran by these old dudes on a phone with newspaper ads and just like <laughs> bend them over, 
You know, like yeah. it's it's, it's <laughs> My my favorite is when, <laughs> when someone calls and is like, "Hey, we've got this you know crazy coin collection. We can we just bring it in and drop it off?" And let I'm like, "No, you yeah. cannot bring it in and drop it off. You <laughs> must sit here and let us go through it. We're gonna educate you on it. You know, yeah. we're gonna, you know what I mean? Like, we're not just gonna you allow sit you here, you, eat your vegetables. Yeah, well, there's a lot of people like, oh, well, this guy just wanted me to come in and drop it off over the weekend. I'm like, uh, you want to drop a hundred grand off to a guy you don't know that you yeah. met off freaking Craigslist over the weekend? I'm like, yeah, it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> I, I, I would, I, I'm not gonna." I'm not going to allow you to do that because I don't want you to think that's normalized, right? Yeah. That's, that's not something that's normal. So, yeah. no, we're going to actually set an appointment. You're going to come in here at, at 9 o'clock, and you're going to you're gonna sit and power through. We're going to order you lunch, yeah. and we're going to knock this thing out, yeah. right? But it's crazy that people are just conditioned to, oh, I have this burden yeah. that I need to yeah. sell. I'm like, this is not a burden. Yeah. These are collectibles that yeah. are probably yeah. worth a lot more than you think than you're giving them credit for. Yeah. And I'd much rather be the good guy than the bad guy, right? Yeah. Giving bad news all how many, like, all the stuff that comes in, how much of it is being passed down or just from s- somebody older that the person that's bringing in has no idea? Like, they didn't, you know. We've started to see more of the families coming in prior to, let's just say someone you know, is unfortunately ill uh-huh. and they're looking at, you know, six months or a year. And they're like, I'm trying to get my affairs in order. I collected this, you know, in the back in the 60s and 70s mm-hmm. and lost interest in the 80s and had kids in and just – didn't have time to really keep building it, but I never wanted to get rid of it. I wanted to pass it to my daughter, but she has zero interest in it. What should I do? And I'm, for me, it's like, don't wait. Don't allow her to come in and bring it after you've passed because yeah. then it's just a complete detachment. Why don't we yeah. look at it now, see what it's worth, let you decide what you want to do with it now if you want to convert it into bullion, which is what we recommend. And, it, yeah, obviously it's good for us because we get to sell bullion. But yeah. remember, we're only making a few points on bullion. It's really better for the customer to have the metal yeah. because we do, at our core, believe that these metals are going to continue to go up. And, right. you know, if it was any day ab- before today, we've been right, right? Yeah. So you just – you we want to it, – It's sometimes it's hard. I mean, I remember – you know, I was talking to my dad about this deal the other day, and if and if you're out there with this deal, please bring it back. Um, <laughs> it was the coolest deal of walkers I've ever seen in my entire life. Okay. And it was all PCGS. The short set dates were all in seven. They were old series holders. I mean, there were so many coins in there that I graded. I, I, I mean, I thought I graded them eight, but, you know, who knows? And then the key dates, 19S was a four. 21S was a four, 21D was a four, the six, you know, 16s were in six. I mean, it was just the most beautiful Walker set I had ever seen in my entire life. And I made an offer to buy. He saw us on television and brought his wife in to get an idea of what it was worth if something ever happened to him. Okay. So the commercial prompted him to get off his butt and say, hey, you know what, let me at least just get this you know, looked sure. at. And this is like probably 2015. And... I didn't want to let him leave. I wanted it yeah. so bad. And I, I think I came up to I came up to a number that I thought was a lot of money. And he was like, yeah. He's like, see, I told you. And she was just mystified. She's like, oh, huh. this whole time he's been telling me it's been worth this number. And, and yeah. you know, it took me it took me 15 minutes, maybe really 12 or something. I, I just looked through and just pulled the calculator out. And I just started kind of going off of what sure. I knew. And, you know, would look at the gray sheet for some of the other dates because, you know, you don't see 19Ss in four. You don't see some of the 19 Ds and four. You don't see some of these dates all the time. Okay. So I did a little reference and I added probably an extra 10%. And then I was like, maybe I should add an extra 10%. And I just, you know, kept going in my head because I just didn't want this deal to leave. Yeah. He wasn't selling it if I offered, well, if I offered him, you know, a big, big number, he probably was going to sell it. But yeah. anything related to what it was truly worth, he wasn't going to sell it. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to come back and talk to you on Saturday. My butt was here. At 9 o'clock, an hour before we opened, <laughs> and almost an hour before we left, Just waiting for that sure. guy on Saturday. Yeah. yeah, because it was one of the coolest deals up to that point in my in my career yeah. that I had ever seen that we were going to be able to produce over the counter. And those deals are out there. You know, they're, they're in our city, they're in your city, they're in every city in this country. And somebody's going to buy it, and it's going to buy this. It's going to be the guy that's going to be proactive about it. It's going to be the guy that's got the good reputation. And it's going to be the guy that's done the right things. And then also it's going to be the, the guy on, the, on in the We Buy Gold shop that doesn't know what the hell he's doing. He's going to sell them for Seriously. melt, you know, and that's going to happen. And that's, you know, that's why you said to me, like, to me, I always feel like I have some, there's business for me to be doing, whether it's yeah. here. Like if, if the store gets slow, I'm in the shops, yeah. right? And if the, if the, if the stores get cl- slow, I'm at the coin shows. 
Yep. Right? There's always a way for me to go out and generate funds yep. because we have a checkbook and a reputation. Yep. And as long as we can keep those two things good, mm-hmm. we're going to be fine. Yep. Right? And that's just the mindset of a coin shop owner. Yeah, I, I, I got a question for you. Sure. Uh, you know, just just kind of the little exposure I've gotten, like it's it's almost embarrassing how much more you guys, the knowledge bank that you guys have, right? I mean, you go from pricing a diamond. I'm not gonna say the price; it was a significant amount. Yeah. You know, t- to buying jewelry, to grading coins, to looking at memorabilia. Right. I mean, it's like when when you you bring somebody new in the business, like here, local, like, like say you bring somebody, does everybody that's a buyer here have to already have prior experience or you, will you take somebody completely green and teach them the business? Yeah. I'd rather them not have any experience okay. because they're pri- habits. Yeah. Their prior experience probably sucks. Right. Yeah, okay. I mean, just to be honest with you, like we just want to, a lot of buyers that come from other places, they, they teach them a broad, there's a broad curriculum and there's nothing that's really finite. And we want to bring it down to the most basic level, start it there with the ABCs, and then work our way into the more um, the more advanced level. Yeah. So I almost like it better when they come in. The first thing I look for in employees in, the, in this business on the counter side of it is snap. It's how much snap do you have? Okay. Right? What we do you have mean a, by that? I mean, it's just snap. I mean, how how quick are you on the draw? Right? How how quick can you can you so the, the, the diamond customer comes in. The problem with the diamond customer is a diamond customer has an appraisal that an insurance, yeah, yeah. that's yeah, an yeah. insurance appraisal. So I remember this. Yeah, yeah. So you're batting. You're really looking. I, at, I used to always tell them, by the way, I was like, you know what? Just take it to the insurance company. Then have them buy it from you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Let me know how that goes. And yeah. that just, yeah. that conversation never goes well after yeah. that comment. Right. Cause <laughs> yeah. we've had them. Cause of some people, they give you no choice. Yeah. You know, they're like, well, this appraisal. I was like, well, listen, Find somebody that'll buy it closer to the appraisal. I wish you the best luck, and right. I truly do. Yeah, I, I just don't know that customer. Yeah, the people that we do business with, they don't. They look at the appraisal, and they're they're thinking twenty five percent of that number. Right, right. And if it's something that's exemplary and that that makes and that 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 carves out room for more profit or more premium, we'll definitely find it out, and we'll we'll pay you for it if we can. But so those customers are tough. They're a different degree of tough because they're coming in with a preconceived notion that their product or their valuable is worth closer to this appraisal price, and yeah. it's just not. So you're so, not starting a new buyer on diamonds? No. I mean, where, where do they cut their teeth at? And how long does it take before yeah, they're like... To, for me to feel comfortable yeah. on diamonds, I you, give them... Because just to put some context, like, I mean, there's probably people listening been here, but, like, it was interesting to me, like, you and your brother, and kind of, you know, Ryan was here too, like, you just let them do their thing. You never like really had to approve any purchase. I'm sitting here like, man, how do you know that guy's buying that right? Like, how do you know he knows what that is? Like, well, that's yeah. years of doing your homework, right? So it's like I, I feel like a fifth grade teacher. I'll take all of the purchases and sales, and I'll okay. go home and I'll grade them, Uh-oh. and I'll bring it back with my red marker. And when someone's new, we'll put them through that yeah. through that test. And obviously, we don't just throw somebody up there, right? Is they they've got to do a couple mirroring. They've got to do a mirror session. They've got thirty day. Um, 30 day no purchase window so I don't want them buying anything for 30 days so you've got to be out there on the floor then you've got to pass a few tests from myself and Matt and then we circulate you in on a small scale so we'll put one guy he'll be our rover so he'll basically come in make sure all the all the uh, customers are, are, are greeted and put in the right lines set up for the right buyer because right now we have Travis as our main jewelry buyer He's done an amazing job. He's done. He's taken all the tests that we've asked him to taste, the GIA stuff. He's done everything that we've needed him to do. We pay yeah. for all that, right? So we, we, we put we, we not only give him the opportunity to learn on the job, but we also give him paper trading, right? And, and really, I mean training, paper training, and really want him to take those courses that GIA offers for a couple hundred bucks and other online courses that we use. So that once we get them up to a speed that we feel comfortable, then it's now you're playing the Google AdWord game and you're trying to get as much volume in here as possible. Okay. And then it's grading every deal that comes in. So for the first 30 days after we put them on the floor, it's like you buy a deal, you bring it to me before we write the check. Because okay. I, it's not f- just so I can make sure that you're that we're not paying too much, but honestly, it's more because I want to make sure we're paying fair. Right. Mm-hmm. Because it doesn't do me any good to get on television, to get on the radio, to be on Google spending yeah. godly, you know, just crazy amounts of money in advertising to not do what we say we're going to do. Right. I mean, why would I do that? Yeah. Right. So it done. No, yeah. I'm not doing that. So yeah, I want to make sure that a we're getting a fair deal, but b more importantly that the customer is getting a fair deal. 
Yeah, because if you're new and you're like, the only way to mess up is to pay too much. So I'm going to go way too low. Exactly. And that's the mindset. And that's why I don't want people that have come in because some shop owners are like, hey, if it's, if you, if your gut's wrong, sure, just go pay down. half. Yeah. And I'm like, and, and, and I'll hear, hear a guy come in and say that. And yeah. we had one recently. And he was like, yeah, I just figured, you know, like, you know, if I, yeah. oh he's like, gosh. maybe it was fake. I'm like, bro, you're about to get fired. Like, don't. Please, who taught you that? You know, you need to listen. You need to go home for. T- I sent him home. I said, "Listen, you go home for the rest of the week. Think about you come that. back." I was like, "You come back." I was like, "You need to literally forget everything you've learned, and you need to let me reteach you the way that we want to do it. If not, you can take a hike. It's not going to hurt my feelings." For you. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's okay. It's okay because that kind of thinking is going to let literally you got another five minutes or something, right. and you're out of here. Yeah. Like it's just not going to work. So we've got to get you recalibrated and try to get your brain to. Think customer first, yeah. right? Make sure that you're understanding why they're coming in and the situation that they're in, and then you can start. Because the market's a market on a lot of things. But when it comes into jewelry, you know, if we have to squeeze a little bit, we can do that. Yeah. Right? On watches, if we, we could squeeze a little bit, we can. Mm-hmm. If it's a super nice watch and it's got, all the right, it's got the right box, the right paper, and it's got everything it needs, then sure, there's a little extra meat on the bone that we can spare if you know, someone's in a tight spot or something. On that stuff that comes in over the counter, watches, jewelry, let's call it cards too. Do you have a lot of cards coming over the counter? Oh yeah, no, we buy a ton of sport cards, man. Is most of your all's out like selling of that merchandise is over the counter back to the other people to walk in, or is it? I mean, in a perfect world, we'd like to think it is. I'd like all the Highline stuff is like so yeah. all the more expensive nice stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah ten to fifteen thousand dollar you know sport like you saw the Tiger Woods signed golf club. I mean, obviously that goes to a home that that's you know yeah. either myself. We already got it loaded up in the car. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. but look, but I, I would sell yeah. it to y'all. Like, but that that's the kind of that's the I would much rather sell it to somebody that I know. Yeah. So again, I have the action of buying it back. Sure. To me, if you're like, yeah, I bought that, I paid five grand for it. What would you pay me? Forty five hundred bucks. Yeah. Ship it. Let's do it. Right, I try to sell my friend stuff that I have about a ten percent spread on. So if you ever get bored of it, it's not like you lose forty or fifty percent of your yeah. value. You know, it's like, you know, what is a Tiger Woods upper deck golf club autograph golf club going to go down? No, no way. <laughs> no. And if it does, you got bigger problems. Yeah, <laughs> you do. You just got bigger problems. Yeah, that's right. Right. That's so, right. Yeah. you know, then then everything's half, and then you can't get mad at me because yeah, right. everything's half off. Yeah, so sure. just right. don't get mad at me. That's the market, right? right? Yeah. But so we. If it's a, you know, Gary Player sign club, that probably just gets moved out wholesale, yeah. right? I don't have the Gary Player customer. I do have the Tiger Woods customer. And then we try to mold those customers into buying the high line stuff that we know we can trade at margin, yeah. right? How many items come in the shop monthly or whatever where do you ever have to make calls and be like, man, this is, it's, it's just, I think Diamond is maybe a decent example. Like, I don't know, I need a second opinion. So my... It's funny you bring that up because I, I, we talk about this a lot. I'm a big, I'm anti on that because the second you make a phone call, you're no longer the guy. Okay. Right? If I have I've, to, heard, you, I've heard you say that on the podcast. Yeah. But man, how can you be the guy on everything? It's big, crazy. Big cojones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, you just have to yeah. do it. You know, you just have to, you have to believe in yourself. And like you said, I'm not going to buy it cheap. Just to to save face, I'm just that's just not a mindset that we have. Instead, it's like, okay, what do I think I can sell this for? What do I think I can get? And then that's where the number comes from, yeah. right? What am I going to offer this out at? And you know, we had an instance the other day where a lady brought in this really beautiful diamond ring that had all the GIA everything, and it was a it was a uh, eternity band that had half carat emeralds in it. I believe okay. it was fifteen. It was fifteen stones that were all individually serted. And they were all DVS. I mean, just beautiful quality, great ratio. But in the last couple of years, the lab-grown market is making these stones for 10% of what a regular diamond is. Yeah. And it's why crazy. in the world would anybody spend twenty five or 15000 on an eternity band when they can buy one for 2500 at Costco that's got the same quality diamond in it? Now, one's lab and one's natural. But I don't As a care. buyer, do you care? <sighs> I'm yeah. torn. I'm I, torn yeah. because I do get it again. Putting myself I, I find in the customer. diamond industry to be one of the most like, I don't even know. I don't know what I can say on the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> like well, it's so weird. And again, I just wish it was different. I would say that I wish it's it was just different. not, and it's just not going to be. Like I don't know if you could ever own a domain called FairDiamonds.com. No, I don't know if it I exists. would never. Even I don't know if it exists. It. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, a fair diamond. <laughs> what is a fair diamond? Nobody even. It's the spreads are 15, 20, 30 points, yeah. and that's just you know. Again, I, a, a guy told me who I respect a lot in the memorabilia business told me 
And I asked him, I was like, why is the memorabilia business so touch and go where like I can take a Magic Johnson jersey that I think's worth four or five hundred bucks and a guy's like, I'll pay you eighty. And I'm like, Well, wait a minute, hold on. Like, yeah, how can we walking. be that far off? He's like, Well, yeah. I mean, I just put a number on it. You know, you're looking for you're looking to sell it in this. And I'm like, Okay, I don't deal with people like you. Yeah. What's market? Like, what is the market? And it's like, well, you put a price on it. I was like, dude, if I wanted to put a price on it. I would be in your shoes. Right. I'm asking you your opinion of what it's worth. You can't get a straight answer out of a lot of these guys. Yeah, yeah. And I, that's just not a business I want to be in. So when it comes to sports memorabilia, again, I'm going to buy it based off of what I'm going to sell it for yeah. and what I'm going to ask for because that's what I that's the number that I have to hold myself accountable if it ever comes back. Yeah. If I sell this Michael Jordan jersey and it happened, you know, we we sold a Michael Jordan jersey that we bought, and it was like, I don't know, I think I paid 2500 bucks for it, and we sold it to a guy for 3250 something in that price range. And he's like, hey, I had a friend over, and they said it wasn't authentic and this and that, and we knew 100% it was authentic. Right. But again, I'm not going to argue with the guy. I'm not going to get in this big spat. I was like, listen, I can send it off to another third party of your choice, and I'll pay the, I'll pay the freight. Yeah. I'll handle it. I'll take care of the authentication and the freight. I have no issue with doing that. I just want my money back. And I started thinking, well, well, now this sounds like yeah, he's yeah. in a money problem. He probably lost poker last weekend, and he's over here sure. trying to figure out how he's not going to, you know, he's going to have to sell when his Jordan jersey so his wife doesn't yeah, see his saw the, Yeah, spouse saw the credit card bill. Yeah, so now I'm in a position, I'm like, okay. So this guy's obviously lying to me. He doesn't want to take the free option, which is let me send it off and get it authenticated from another company. Yeah. He doesn't even want to hear that, which means it's no longer about the jersey. Now it's about the money. And I asked him, I was like, well, what do you think is fair? And he said, well, I like, I would like all of my money back. I was like, well, that's not fair. Hmm. He was like, that's fair to you. That's not fair to us. I was like, well, what do you think is fair for us? And he said, I don't know, 3000 I said, fine, I'll write you a check for 3000 hmm. And I bought it. And I did send it off to get all dedicated to get it. And it was, it was perfect. But <laughs> yeah. again, you know, I'm just like, I'm not going to have this issue again. And it sure. cost me 250 bucks. Yeah. They did get it done, but yeah. alas, you know, Michael Jordan jerseys were like 4500 bucks. That guy got a huge deal. If he'd been smart, he'd have sold it elsewhere, but instead he tried to get me and pressure me to hold my feet to the fire, which yeah. we took care of it like a phoenix, right? And I just, that type of stuff happens in these markets where rare coins a lot different. You don't, you buy a silver dollar for a thousand bucks, there's going to be four or five companies that are ready to pay 900. Right. And, and that's where I like being in, involved. That to me, that's where, it's supported by many. And I said that earlier, there's a lot of good companies around that will play the game of numismatics and they will play close to the hip. Yeah. Um, you know, I know, I mean, honestly, I know a lot of them. I, I wish it was thinner, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it's not. And I think at the end of the day, it's good for everybody because that's just more people who can get in and get treated the right way. Yeah. On, your, on your Michael Jordan jersey story, how many, how many times has it happened where – you you ship something to somebody and they're like, oh, this isn't this isn't fake. I'm gonna send it back to you or whatever. And they try to actually ship you something, like they try to they get a Michael Jordan jersey, like try to sign it or whatever. Like, yeah. does that happen to you guys? Not yet. Really? Uh -uh. God, I feel like we, I mean, there's always people trying to defraud us in so many different ways. I man. was gonna ask you. We're about so that. skeptical about everything. Yeah, I was gonna like, ask you about that. Like, what what is y'all's fraud rate? And like, what are some of the? Can you give us like two or three that maybe some of our maybe some of our viewers or, or listeners can can just kind of. They can put their data bank and they can spot it. I mean, what are some of the frauds you guys see a lot of? Man, it's 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 mainly just people trying to like defraud us to make money, right? Yeah. So not, I mean, we do definitely see some fake stuff come in in, in the buyback stuff, but that's so obvious. It's we like, catch yeah. that yeah, yeah. before it even hits anything because we have test everything. Do you have we anything? test more product than anyone else in the space? Do you? anyone? What do you, we how do you have test a, it? We, we have Sigma scanners. Okay, we have multiple XRF Sigmas. Nice. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah. But um, there's a lot of different ways to test a lot of different things. But we don't have necessarily an army of numismatists, which can be a good or a bad thing. Sure. Up at the vault. Like, but sometimes the numismatist says, my eye is better than any tester. If you're good, maybe. Uh, if you're not, you're going to cost me money. I just don't know it yet. <laughs> uh, so we test everything. So we don't have that issue of stuff coming back because we're just not going to pay for it. Uh, but where we, we have a lot more of the exposure is you know, we're running an e-commerce site. Yeah. That's gets down a much different slippery Credit slope. cards and all that. Let's, let, let, let's, let's talk a little bit about the fraud, though, because yeah. I think it is important. And, again, that's you know, one of the things that we try to educate yeah. people is on the other side of that. Like, what are some of the things they can they can look out for? Do you guys have a third-party service that helps uh, vet your credit card? Yeah, yeah. of okay. course. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, some, <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. Honestly, I say, I, some yeah, I know. people don't. I know. You know? And we're a small yeah. company. We do. Yeah, yeah. Right? Just because – 
I woke up one day to like, I don't know, it was like 26 or 27 chargebacks. I'm yeah. Like, oh, my gosh, we're not cut out for this. Yeah. <laughs> right? well, that's yeah. like as soon as you go online, that's probably – so that happened to us in probably 2014, 2015. Yeah. Right? So it, it happens to everybody, and that's when you learn like, oh, okay. And, and, and until you know that, yeah. like, you, you don't know that you need sure. to have a third party involved, right? And so, yeah, I mean, you can lose some money real quick on it. But, yeah, we, we have uh, various third parties actually for just – not just credit card. Uh, but all other types of transactions. And, There's and, people that also yeah. try to uh, impersonate our brand and contact oh, man. people. Yeah. Oh, I just bet. offer stuff that oh, would never be offered. I get a LinkedIn message or an Instagram message at least once, you know, once or twice a week oh. that someone's using my picture from Facebook and yeah. putting it on a like a, a business card yeah. and, you know, or like a, a work ID or something, a lanyard ID, and it's like, hey, I'm someone named Kenny Duncan sold me these twelve rupees, and they. Yeah. they and it's like, uh, I'm like, dude, we don't, we don't do that. Well, uh, do you, now that's an interesting question. Do you worry about with how much uh, audio recording you're part uh, of having yeah, you know, your face? Yeah, your not voice. until, you know, six months ago. Yeah. But again, that's a new hurdle, right? And as you know, these guys are up right now trying to figure out how to scam people. Yeah. I mean, they're doing it as we speak. It's, it's, it's not stopping. It. And it, what's, what stinks is that they're getting better. They're yeah. getting more creative. Like, I mean, right now, uh, two weeks ago, we had just a uh, almost. I don't know how many employees were, were were messaging me like, "Hey, are you are you messaging me?" Like, you know, they'll they'll send text to our employees, "Hey, this is this is Chase. Let me, I got a new number. Let me know if you got this." Oh my gosh! Oh it, yeah. It was crazy. Is like the, our dude, our head of fraud, who's amazing, by the way, amazing, messaged me. He's like, "Why are you messaging me?" I'm like. Dude, you're, you're getting whacked. <laughs> Come right on, now. man. Come yeah. on. I'm paying you for this. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's how good they are. Yeah. And so they're just like, you know, every day is a, di- a different uh, new case. And it's, it's, there's so many different ways they come at you. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. you know, these days, like, man, yeah. and the elderly, they just they We have just lots crush. of things in this world. We have access to more information than we ever have, but we're so short on common sense. Yeah. So, like, yeah. my. Well, that's the snap thing I was talking about earlier. Yeah. yeah. My. Yeah. Do you have it? My wife's grandmother was contacted, this was like three years ago, four years ago, contacted by this phone, by the way, late, uh, you know, my wife's name, uh, she's in jail, you need to wire us X amount of money, yeah. this and that, she, she was embarrassed, well, I think they're in person anyway, calling you, and she, and she just said, this is a scam, my granddaughter wouldn't call me, she'd call her mother, hung up on them. Wow. <laughs> Way to go. Thanks your granny, let's go. Gangster yeah, but granny. you just need more of that common sense, I mean, yeah. a lot of people just, they get caught up, they believe one little the false truth, that's how they get you, that's the hook. And all of a sudden you're you're playing their game for the next three hours while you just get, get gobbled how, how up. Many t- how many times are people in here trying to sell you fake stuff? It happens. I mean a couple times a week. Yeah. Yeah. Is it is it ever like uh, does it ever get kinda out is of it hand? contentious? Yeah. Um so we made a we made a boo boo recently and it was it was over a couple hundred dollar trade dollar, but um it was bought up front by one of the new guys. Yeah. And it was in an album, um, one of those little brown albums, and he just kind of flipped through pages and you know figured it for, I don't know, I think he paid 125 bucks for it, and it was the when I, I didn't see it, so I mean here let's just be completely honest, it was put on my desk, it was in a big group of other things, and I just kind of scanned over, and I was like I'll send it over to eBay and let them price it and put it online, right? Oh man. And I get a phone call. I say I got a phone call. I got a text message from John Albanese, and he said, "Hey, we need to talk about this." And it was a photo of this trade dollar up there. And I'm like, "Oh my gosh, Kenny, what did you guys do?" So we immediately pull it down. It only been up for like you know an hour or something, yeah. but it just goes to show you that you have to have clamps on everything, right? Well, you yeah, just, but you man, but you can't be perfect, like, no, especially with the volume that we you know both of us do. Yeah, I know, but still, right? It's like I mean, when you see this trade dollar, I mean, it's just a it's the worst fake. And yeah. It's just not even. It's like a freaking. Well, you're Chuck teaching Cheese seminars. <laughs> it, it, like you're it's at, got you're the doing the A and A. You're teaching classes. Yeah. Right? So big. I mean, that's it's awesome that that's yeah. one thing you've kind of taken on is the education piece, which a lot of people are interested in kicking the ladder. Yeah. Especially in this industry, it's crazy. Well, so much was given to me in terms of knowledge from a lot of different people, and I feel it would be rem- I would be remiss if I didn't. If someone asks, calls on me to do something that's for the better of the hobby, I'm going to try to do it to the best of my ability every single time, yeah. because I feel like this is a, like this hobby is a gift to me, right? I, I just I could have never imagined that we would have been able to take what we what we started on, you know, 15 years ago and take it this far. So, you know, I try to keep a certain sense of gratefulness about 
the position and things of that nature, right? And just yeah. like how do we use that position to 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 better help you know the community of of coin collectors? Because I don't want to see what happened to philatelics stamps, right? I don't want to see there's not a stamp there's not a stamp place in the whole city. Nobody will take them. I don't know what they're worth anymore. Right? I don't. I just stop jacking with stamps because yeah. just nobody will provide you liquidity for them. Right. If you can't get liquidity, then why would you jack with sure. it? Right. Yeah. It just doesn't yeah. make any more sense. Yeah. I just don't want to see that happen to coins. Coins are just too cool. There's too much of there's too much of a historical artifact you know, part of that. Right. I mean, you just think about like silver dollars that were a part of the Wells Fargo hoard and the banks that were robbed. Yeah. It just there's so many alluring stories that you can attach to them and marketing stories and. It's just like are, a, are we producing anything today as a country that you think is will be similar to the Morgan dollars a uh, hundred years from now? No, and that's uh, so okay. I didn't know the answer, but I was thinking yeah. no. But My, that's the I, scary I part about like why would coin collect? I mean, well, I think that's why you know I think that's why I mean I, I, I like gravitate to younger guys in this because I feel like we are the guys that are going to get that done. We have to do something cool, and I and they've made attempts. But again, you know, they, they re-released the Peace Dollar, re-released the Morgan. I think that was a good step. Yeah. But, you know, when you look at the coins, you know, I, I, for me, me, this is just me personally. It's not the company view, but yeah. my personal views, I'm just not a huge fan. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, it just doesn't, they're pretty. Yeah. For like the first time you see them, like, oh, cool, because it's different. You know, it's not a, you know, pursuit of happiness coin. It's not a, you know, it's, it doesn't have some crazy theme. Like, no, this is old school, Carson City, yeah, you yeah. know, 21, you know, this is a 100-year anniversary of, you know, and it's like, okay, now this is a great segue. And they didn't miss, yeah. but made a lot of coins. And you have to make a lot of coins because a lot of people that want them. Yeah. But when things are done more for marketers instead of hobbyists, you know, I think you start to lose a little bit about, again, why we're doing this, right? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to earlier part of the conversation, consolidation. That's why it actually is a huge problem, is the marketers that are really, really massive, able to create their own marks, create product, create I mean, anything they want. Their only incentive is, I mean, if they're publicly traded, great. There's your incentive, boost stock price. Probably held, boost your bonus. But they're just creating things that are good for the company in the short term, customer in the long run. You know, yeah, depends on the company. You know, and and, and I guess the you know the, the devil's advocate playing on that is that well, you, someone has to get coins in people's hands, and it's expensive to run those companies, right? I mean, I I don't own one, but you know I've seen overhead and heard of overhead projections on some big ones, and I'm telling you, it it costs a lot of money to sit people in those seats to try to push those products out, and you know it's kind of a catch twenty two. You have to have products in the market for other people to know about them, right? We're, we kind of had that issue with celebrity men, right? Yeah. Is that we, we made such a, <laughs> we made such a unique product and we tried to block uh, the ways that we were going to sell it. And we kind of did it in reverse. We needed to kind of bleed products out a little bit, let people know about who we are and what we're making, and then try to go to a smaller mintage model or something. Right. Yeah. And, and instead, you know, we came out gunslinging. Is that one of the, Probably the biggest takeaway you've had because that's yeah. new venture yeah. you know, for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, looking back at it, I mean, we should have made a lot less, right? And probably just try to build a base the slow and easy way, but I just never done it that way. I just, <laughs> where, where, where do you, on Celebrity Man, I'm just curious, like, what is your five and 10 year horizon? Like, where do you see that thing in five and 10 years? Because it's, give you my it's two definitely year one projection. of the most exciting things. <laughs> I, I'll give you my two year projection. Okay. Well, All right. look, I think we've learned a lot. And we've gotten a lot of good feedback, uh, a lot of good constructive criticism, and a lot of praise. And we've done some really cool things. I mean, look, we made we made one of the coolest coins I've ever seen with Mike Tyson, yeah. right? I mean, it's, it's I don't give a, I don't give a care what really what anybody says about it. I mean, we pulled something really cool off, right? We had Mike Tyson on eBay Live, you know, screaming "Illegal tender." It's not illegal tender. <laughs> that didn't sound look good. That didn't sound good. Illegal tender. <laughs> You know, I just think that was kind of cool, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. we, we we threw uh, we threw Ric Flair in a plane and we yeah. took him to the New York Comic Con and launched uh, and launched a product with him. Yeah. And I just, you know, looking back at that time, that was that was like one of the coolest times of my life, yeah. right? I mean, it just it was fun. Um, you know, we're making coins with people now. We we broaden our horizons a little bit. We've got some contracts with some really cool people coming up. I mean, yeah. it, I think the next two years for Celebrity Man is going to be very exciting. Yeah. Um, t five to ten year. I mean, man, I. I got big goals, but I, I I'm I'm looking at a two year window right now, because yeah. I've got I've got projects pretty much mapped out for yeah. the next two years. Gotcha. We've got some really cool names, so it, that part of it's just super exciting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, I was thinking we were talking about the U.S. Mint making collectibles and the, the Morgans and the, the pre thirty threes, but does does coin collecting in the future have to be made by a U.S. government? Well, I, no, I don't think so. Yeah. And that's why I think we're all here. There's yeah. a proof of concept that there's well, fifty years ago, hundred years ago, there was no other mint, no other sovereign mint. I mean, there was Royal Mint, obviously doing stuff, Canadian Mint, but not to that degree. I really appreciate that, seriously. And you guys coming down, you said you guys were going to do it. You did it, and I appreciate it. And we're going to definitely reciprocate. Yeah, man, thanks for having us. We look forward to hosting you uh, you know, this year, for sure. Let's do it. Yeah. Appreciate it. Cool. Thank Learned you, a lot. We're doing a lot of business. Pre-33, we are going to be able to help educate our guys, educate the customers. We're going to be able to learn a lot from your all's expertise. So I want to see you behind that counter again. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Up the sleeves. Coin Shop Podcast. Thank you, guys. <laughs>